The confession for you today, I've got absolutely zero experience in running a museum, setting up displays in a museum, or anything to do with museums. Which, truth be told, is what makes it so exciting and interesting to come in every day and be surrounded by all of this and work on all of this, and why my new catchphrase should probably be, that took a bit longer than I expected, because I'm doing a lot of these things for the first time. And one such example that took a bit longer than I expected was setting this up. So what I've done at this end of the room this is its third incarnation, by the way. Some of you will recognize this end of the cave. Originally, it was the studio end with all the apple crates. And then I said it was the system library. It was a good idea in theory, but I don't think that's going to work. The idea of the system library was we were going to have lots of systems in their boxes and volunteers on public days when people come to the museum would say, I want to try that system, and we'd set it up. It would probably put a bit too much stress on the volunteers to be swapping systems out during a public session. And it would probably put quite a bit of wear and tear on the machines to be doing that. So it was a good idea in my head, but I think we need to move on from that. And I've made sure that this space is now a rotating temporary exhibition area. And what I've set up today is our first temporary exhibition. It's all about Japanese systems. Here's a look at some of the things I'm going to show you today. Some of them exclusive to Japan, some of them were sold further afield, but all of them with a quite interesting story to tell. Some of them you've seen on the channel before, like the X68000. And one of the items, this one here, is incredibly rare. Uh, I can't wait to show you this, and we'll get to that a little bit later. It took a four-hour round trip for me to go and collect it for this purpose. And uh, I didn't quite realize its value until I got it set up. So I'm going to have to think about some kind of uh, glass case to put around it. But we'll get onto that a little bit later. Why did it take me longer than expected to settle this up? Well, as I'm learning the hard way, when you're building displays in a museum, some of these items were already on display. Not all of them, but a few of them. When you move a display from one place to another, you leave a hole, you need to fill that hole, and you need to tell a story where you filled that hole. So I need to update the signage. I need to make sure it's interesting for someone to walk up to that display, and it tells a continuous story about a subject that's interesting. You can't just chuck things out willy-nilly on shelves. Um, so uh, I had to fill shelves. I had to fill two entire cabinets again and tell a new story in those cabinets, having removed things from them to put out here. So everything has a knock-on effect. These are just the lessons that anyone that runs a museum, I'm sure, already knows. But uh, I'm having to learn as I go along. But hopefully the outcome is something that you can enjoy, whether you come in person or in the video today, as I give you a tour of everything. And let's do that right now. I'm going to take you around all of this cool Japanese stuff and uh, teach you a little bit about each thing. Let's have a look. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, and injection molding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com, and we thank them for their support. Let's start with the rack on the left then, and some of the older items. That seems like a logical place to start. And we'll start with this. It's a 1978 Sharp KJS TV game. Are those two CB radio handsets for talking to passing truckers? Well, they look like they could be, but no, they're actually paddles for this, what is a hotel pong system. Each controller has a spinner, and it's the right-hand controller that has a button. You don't get that on the left. And that's to serve or to start the game. Lime green is not a colour choice you often see on old tech, but I kind of like it. Tennis, car race or hockey are the choice of game selected using the centre dial. I think that's a one or two player switch there on the left, and on the right we can switch between the game and regular TV output. So this would sit between your aerial and your TV just like a VCR would. A coin slot on the right hand side charges 100 yen for a game, I can see how it would have been tempting to have a few games in your hotel room to pass the time, especially if you were on your own. The natural step on from Pong, of course, is Breakout. Pong with bricks to smash. 
And that's what this 1979 Nintendo Color TV game offers. This is pre-NES Nintendo, and it's part of a range of TV games which were commercially successful and so steered Nintendo towards a future of making home game consoles. If we take a closer look, there's a big lozenge on the left-hand side here, that's the serve button. The power switch is right next to it for easy rage quitting, and then there's a reset button next to that. There are six game types to select from, and to the right of that you can also play with three, five or seven balls. The game types are these block patterns here, so presumably you don't progress through the levels, you just select a level to play on and away you go. It's a lovely piece of Nintendo history that's overshadowed now by their other consoles and their arcade successes. And it's also a very, very 70s orange colour. I like it. And if we look on the underside, the Japanese text on the label there, which is bold at the bottom, that's Nintendo's name in the bold letters there. The first of the range came out in 1977, and overall 1.5 million units are reported to have sold. That's pretty impressive considering this was an already flooded market full of Pong clones. I think I've mentioned it a couple of times before, so let's get to this one now. It was known to me as the NES, but before that it was the Famicom. And our Famicom has some added extras. Nintendo's 1983 family computer was built to be cheap just like the TV game before it, and the Game & Watch handhelds which they'd now found success with in the early 80s. And the red, cream and gold colour scheme has become iconic over the decades. The story goes that Nintendo's president used to wear a red scarf of that colour. He liked it, and that's how it was chosen. Personally, I'm a fan of any electronics in red cases, so I wish there were more. Our Famicom is paired with the Family Computer Disk System from 1986, which allowed developers to produce much cheaper disk-based games than the cartridge alternatives. That's not to say the NES control deck that the West got was a bad looking machine. It's beloved for its own reasons, and it certainly looks like it could take more punishment from excited gamers than the original. Not to mention it has controller ports, whereas the original had hardwired controllers. They're both great looking machines though in their own right. Speaking of controllers, the original had a microphone built into Player 2's pad. It was only supported by a handful of games with mechanics such as blowing into it to turn a windmill, or in the case of Zelda, shouting into it to kill enemies. This was totally dropped from the control deck that we got. Cartridges also come in a different shape to our western carts, and some of them come in wild colours, not the grey that we had. Look more lime green. When you take the cartridge out, there's also a dust flap behind it, so you can close that and you can protect your port. But you'd probably just leave a game in there when it was turned off. Now, when I was taking this off the shelf, you also saw another microphone, so let's look at that. This is the Bandai Karaoke Studio from 1987. It slots in like a normal game cart and it contains 25 or so songs to sing along to. Add-on cartridges for more songs could be slotted into the rear of the cartridge here. There's a slightly shorter cartridge slot to add those into. Of course, there's no pitch or voice recognition on this hardware. It's far too limited for that. It's just detecting noises made at the right time to score you. As someone said to me recently, if it can make a noise, Japan will find a way of making it into a karaoke machine, and the Famicom is no exception to that rule. So, I'd like to play some Famicom games, I'd like others to be able to come here and try Famicom games, on disc especially. But the disc system that I've got here, it, it looks brand new, it's even got the cardboard transport cutout in the disc drive there in the front. That's okay though, because I've got another fun system to show you now, which will let people try this out, and will let people try the discs. So let's go and have a look at that. Released in 1986, the same year as the disc system, this is the Sharp Twin Famicom. It integrates the disk drive into a more robust looking console, I really like the look of it, and it adds a composite video output. The Famicom only had RF. Sharp officially licensed this clone of the Famicom from Nintendo, so there's no funny business going on here, it's all above board and legit. And while the controllers are still hardwired, there's a really lovely addition of a tray at the back there that you can slot them into and store them when they're not in use. The joypads retain the microphone feature, even though most developers were ignoring it, but it did mean that Sharp could claim 100% compatibility with the Famicom library by keeping it in there. 
The console can work in cartridge or disc mode. You can't have both of them enabled at the same time. So you would slide the switch on the top and that will lock or unlock the cartridge slot and then you would pop your game in. This particular game is called Wagon Land by Namco in which you have to stun your enemies with wagon's roars. That's your character. It seems like an ideal game to have incorporated the microphone, to be honest. You could have roared into your joypad and I think everyone had forgotten the microphone even existed by this point. The monitor, by the way, is a batch of ex-BBC broadcast monitors which originally resided in BBC Television Centre in Shepherd's Bush, which is a really nice bit of history. We've got a stack of them we picked up recently. Let's take a look at one of the discs now, or disc cards as they were officially known. They had 112k capacity and you might assume the whole disc system was a failure because it just wasn't a thing in the West. But to date, the Famicom system is still the best-selling console add-on of all time, with a reported 4.4 million sales. And considering it was only sold in Japan, that's some going. Helped, no doubt, by its launch title, The Legend of Zelda. This is not Zelda, it's Green Beret, and I have to say, it's lovely to try this out. It really does feel novel to load Famicom games from a disc, but I just can't get used to seeing the word loading on title screens. Not seeing the word loading is the main advantage of owning a console, right? So it's quite jarring when it pops up. And it doesn't just load the game once into memory and then play it, it also loads mid-game. In the case of Green Beret here, it loads between each level. But that is the cost of a cheaper medium and cheaper games. The Pro, of course, includes the ability to save your game because it's a disc. And the disc system also added an additional channel of sound, so there's plenty to explore on the disc games beyond what you might expect just to be identical to the cartridge games. There are extra bits. You probably want to see that karaoke system, don't you? Right, okay. Despite being an oversized car, it does indeed fit into the twin Famicom, no problem. But when I turned it on, I just got a blue screen. Oh dear, what a shame. You can imagine how disappointed I was when I couldn't film myself singing. But a broken thing always gets the better of me, so I did give it a clean with some IPA and a cotton bud, and sadly for everyone involved, it worked. Believe it or not, I don't speak Japanese, so I resorted to the Google Translate app again on my phone, and I selected a song which was translated on the screen as Dog Policeman and I gave it my best shot. Where is your house? Where is your house? Where, where is your house? Meow, 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 meow. I don't understand even, even if I ask the sparrow. Meow, meow, meow. I don't understand even if I ask the sparrow. One, one, wow, wow. Let's not talk of this ever again. Karaoke aside, I have to say I think the Twin Famicom is my new favourite way to enjoy the NES or Famicom library. Now one system on our shelves is not like the others and I don't want you to think I've screwed up in my display here. It's down at the bottom left and it's this one, it's the Subo Jackie Chan computer. It's different because it's not Japanese, it's Chinese, but it's here to represent the many unauthorized Famicom clones, or Famiclones as they're called. This one was sold under the guise of an educational computer, and it comes with some edutainment titles, but it also has a joypad, and it runs regular Famicom games. There's a whole video dedicated to this on the channel if you want to find out more, so I won't dwell on it, it's here to represent the whole Famiclone story and how they proliferated around the world. The next logical step from a Famicom, well, it has to be a Super Famicom, right? It's another well-known system, but we've got a fun add-on with ours here on display. The US, of course, you got one, but it was slightly different looking. You had a purple color scheme and a different case. Whereas in Europe, we had a system that looked the same as the Super Famicom, albeit renamed to a Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and we had the same colour scheme on the buttons and everything. So this is quite familiar to me. Released in 1990, its main rival in Japan wasn't the Sega Mega Drive. That took the third spot in that country of the fourth generation consoles. It was the PC Engine, and we'll come on to that one in a moment. 
Sitting next to our Super Famicom is an odd-looking thing, which has been decoupaged by the previous owner. This is a Super Wildcard. If we look underneath, we can see that the model is a 3201DX, and the purpose of this is to back up and to run games from a regular 3.5-inch floppy disk. Unlike the official disk system we saw earlier on the Famicom, this is an unofficial piracy device. The unit slots into the top of the console like so, and then you would load from your floppy disk. Unlike the official Famicom games that we saw on disk earlier, these are rips of cartridges. So it loads the whole cartridge back up into RAM, just like you would load a ROM into an emulator, and then it launches the game from there. And just like an emulator, this also has some cool features. It's got save states, so you can save at any point in your game and then jump back to it and continue playing. As well as a piracy device, it would be an easy way of developing your own games, putting them on floppy disk and trying them out on real hardware without an official dev kit. So it wasn't all about piracy, this thing, just mostly. In much the same way that this, if we just go off on a tangent now and look at the N64, this is the Dr. V64 for the N64. At £350, this was a very low cost development system and was reportedly used by software houses such as Iguana Entertainment. As a piracy device, it wasn't cheap on the face of it, but at around the price of six premium games for the system, well, that would soon pay for itself. Nintendo eventually had it banned from sale in North America. Heavy handed, but not surprising. Let's get back to Japan now, and I mentioned the Super Famicom's rival was the PC Engine from NEC. And our top shelf is dedicated to two machines from that company. The first a success, the other a big failure. The success, of course, was the 1987 PC Engine, which sold over 5 million units in Japan. And for a period, it was the best-selling console in the country. This here was the luxury way of playing it. We're looking at an NEC PC KD863G, or more simply, it's a PC Engine built into a monitor with a stunning picture. I've connected up five controllers to it for some Bomberman action. They're not just hung up there to look pretty, you know. You can take them, unwind them, and play five-player Bomberman, and they all go into this multi-tap. So I hope to get five people around this soon. We've got a meet-up on Sunday, and I'll definitely be pushing for that to happen. But let's not dwell on this, as you have seen it on the channel, nor do I want to dwell on the original PC Engine itself. Seen here in its interface unit, with the CD-ROM-ROM add-on, that was the first add-on CD drive you could buy for a console ever back in the 80s. No, what I want to show you is the grey unit sitting under it, the thing that looks like a gas hob. This is the ROM-ROM amp. It's an official NEC audio amplifier with volume and bass controls and microphone volume and microphone echo controls. Yes, you could plug in two microphones and turn your PC engine into a karaoke machine. Don't worry, I won't. Over here is the box, which also has on the front Amp 30. Uh, it's a really striking box. I like the color scheme on this. And then if you twist it around on the side, you can see on the picture there, it has a pair of speakers to complete it. And also two rails that the interface unit should sit on, perhaps for airflow when the amp gets hot. Sadly, I don't have those rails. What I do have though, is the speakers. And it'd be a crying shame for them not to be out on display. Although they do look suspiciously like they came out of a Japanese car of the era, if you ask me. Anyway, since we're using the PC DB monitor, which has its own amp built in, I'm going to wire the speakers up to it. That will allow us to enjoy the speakers, enjoy that quality CRT image, and there's no danger of someone starting a karaoke party when my back's turned. It's hard to capture what a speaker sounds like on my camera microphone. Of course, it's not of the quality of a large floor standing speaker, but it is as good as I'd say a nice pair of PC desktop speakers. Not the ones that you got bundled with your computer, some nice upgraded ones that you spent a bit of money on. And with them, the PC Engine as ever is a joy to play for you for your family and for your pets to do some karaoke with. 
The PC Engine, the great success that it was, was followed up by the NEC PC FX in 1994. Released only in Japan, this was the same year that the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation arrived, and the 3D console generation was upon us. Unless you bought this. NEC decided to bet the farm on full motion video gaming and created a console that could play 30 frames of JPEG images per second. It was probably the best quality video playback of any console at the time, but it had zero hardware assisted 3D capabilities. To give it some context, it was originally due in 1992, which makes a bit more sense. FMV games and multimedia were the buzz then, but various delays, including a reluctance to damage the PC Engine's strong sales at the time, postponed its release. Only 62 titles were released and it was cancelled in 1998 with just 400,000 sales. It's a shame because it's a 2D powerhouse and it looks like a kind of quirky little PC tower case in its design. I like it, even though it didn't win any favour when it was released. People really didn't like its design and I just think it could have been a lot of fun, but it's understandable why it didn't work at the time. This game, Battle Heat, demonstrates it well. Beautiful visuals, great sound, but very little gameplay. It's a one-on-one -on -one fighter in which you take it in turns to press a combination of buttons on your joypad and then a video of your move will play and then you hope you chose the right move. It's a bit like paper, rock, scissors in video game form. Street Fighter 2, it ain't. They can't all be big sellers or success stories, but they do all have a story to tell, even if that story is one of a company abandoning the home console market as NEC did after the failure of this console. The next system in our pop-up expo also wasn't a big seller. We repaired it on the channel a few years ago and it's still going strong, I'm pleased to say. It's the left-hand side one of our trio here on the back wall. This is the Pioneer Laser Active from 1993. So there would have been some crossover with the PCFX sales. 93, 94, these would have been competing with one another. In its base configuration, the Laser Active is a Laserdisc movie player. Nothing special about that, but what you're seeing on the screen here isn't just a Laserdisc movie playing, it's a Mega LD. That's a Sega Mega Drive game on a Laserdisc, and the game being played is Pyramid Patrol by Taito. What makes it more than a Laserdisc are the interchangeable packs that pop out here on the bottom left. This in here is the Mega Drive pack, and then there's also a PC Engine pack, and of course, yes, there's a karaoke pack for it. With our Mega Drive pack, there's a cartridge slot on the front so you can play regular cartridge games. It also takes Mega CD games, such as these ones here. Now, of course, we also got Mega CD games. They came differently packaged, they had different covers, but they're not so unfamiliar to us. And uh, I have to say Sonic CD here on the left is the most popular one that people play when they come here. But what we didn't get was Mega LD games like this one. It is exciting to load up a 12 inch laser disc to play a game from, but as most of you will have guessed, it doesn't result in a lot of game. It results in a lot of video streaming because that's its strength. And invariably it's on rails shooters that you get to play like this Pyramid Patrol. That being said though, it still plays the whole Mega Drive and Mega CD library. So it's still a fun system to play on with the nicety or oddity, I should say, of playing Laserdisc games. Moving on now, no Japanese exhibit could be complete without the supermodel of the lineup, the Sharp X68000. It's a Motorola 68000 based powerhouse with custom chips to market it as a graphics workstation, and as a result, a mean games machine. Now we have made lots of videos on this, we've replaced the PSU, we've fitted a hard disk and we've learned all about it, and since those videos I have now paired it up with the official TriSync monitor. This was initially on loan, but now we've bought it for ourselves, so it's here for good and it's recapped. There were some early signs of problems with that monitor, but after a recap, it's absolutely solid. The games library on the system ranges from Frogger to Street Fighter 2, 
Pac-Land to Final Fight. Its lifespan from 1987 to 1996 spans generations of games, and it was sold only in Japan. When people ask me for suggestions on what to try when they visit the cave, this is the one I'm going to point them to. Mainly because they're probably familiar with some of the arcade games on here so they can appreciate the game and they can appreciate how good a port it is on hardware that they're not familiar with. It's um, really quite eye-opening for a lot of people. Cost new in 1987, about £6,900 in today's money. That's a lot of Famicoms. A more affordable computer that did well in Japan was the MSX range, so I had to put a few of those out, of course. And at the top, connected up, is a Yamaha CX-5M. MSXs were sold beyond Japan, but they really found favour in Japan as well as Korea, France, Netherlands and Spain. Its goal was to set a standard for micros to be compatible with one another, and it never achieved worldwide success. It didn't become the standard worldwide, but in the areas where it took off, it did do very well. The Yamaha model was aimed specifically at music production, hence the bundled music keyboard with it. And to get the most out of it, I have added a SD card cartridge. This is the SD512. There are other, better, um, more powerful, more feature complete SD card solutions and cartridges that you can add, but this one has me covered. It works just fine for me. And on our little JVC nine inch monitor, you can see here Nemesis. The MSX appeared in 1983, it's got a Z80 CPU and an AY sound chip and on the whole it feels very much like my experience with other Z80 based computers. The ZX Spectrum, the Amstrad CPC, there's a familiarity to it but there's still a lot of new games and there's a lot of fun to be had exploring it. Although I did find the jaunty Nemesis theme tune a bit more American sitcom than Space Shooter. Toshiba, Canon, JVC, Sony, Casio and many more had a crack at making an MSX system like this Sony Hitbit which um, came bundled with a gear knob style joystick kind of reminiscent of the Master Systems control stick but only the top of it moves the whole stick doesn't move it's it's a very odd joystick no wonder it didn't catch on. On the next shelf down I've put some FM Towns machines out. This is a PC that started out exciting and then it put on a suit and tie and got middle-aged. In 1989, it was the first computer released with a CD-ROM drive as standard, tucked on the front of the machine there. And it is a really nice looking machine. Yes, it had an Intel 386 CPU, but it also paired that with a custom video chip and its own operating system to deliver something quite unique. As it evolved though, the custom aspect of the hardware was relegated to an expansion card for compatibility, and it just kind of became an IBM PC compatible running Windows 95. It did throw up something wonderful though, and that was this, the FM Towns Car Marty. It's the very same system squashed down to fit into your car and become its entertainment system. Satnav, audio CDs, and a quick game of Splatterhouse at Gordano Services on the M5. Yes, please. Let's go through a few more systems now. Hopefully you're still enjoying the tour. We've got quite a lot more to get through. This one is a VR 1995 style with the Nintendo Virtual Boy. Before the 3DS, Nintendo were playing with 3D in this, a portable immersive 3D gaming experience. Now what I like about this is that everyone expects it to be rubbish. It's got the word boy in the title, which sets that expectation. And I have to admit, I had this expectation of it being like a Game Boy, like the original Game Boy in its graphics but it's much more like a Super Nintendo in what it can produce. It's actually a 32-bit system with an NEC RISC CPU in its heart. So people step up to it, they expect rubbish, and then they try it and they actually have fun, which is really nice to see. Yes, it's uncomfortable to play for any length of time, but the stereoscopic effect really works well in games like Wario Land, which I'm gonna try and film for you now just by shoving my camera into the headset and we'll see what we pick up.
The stereo effect is not just used on parallax backgrounds, it's not just a, a nicety and a side, it's actually used by the game mechanics. So in Wario Land, for example, you can jump into the background and back into the foreground, and you've got obstacles like spiky balls swinging towards you back and forth um, as you play the game. It's, it's used to great effect, it's, um, it's an interesting mechanic, and it's, it's typical Nintendo, just like the microphone they had on the Famicom. Here's a different way of making and playing games, do what you can with it. But the public had called to the idea of VR because by now the technology they'd realized was expensive. For some, it caused motion sickness and we were getting exposure to it. For example, there were the virtuality machines in our arcades, so we could pay an extortionate amount to have one game on a machine and come away feeling like, okay, great, I'm glad I tried that, but the technology isn't quite there yet. VR wasn't sticking and the Virtual Boy was a commercial failure selling 770,000 units. But as I said, people come away surprised by its capabilities. It deserves a little bit more credit, so I guess I'm making myself an ambassador to promote the Virtual Boy with anyone who comes in here uh, and let them have a go on it. Our final table then is Sega themed. Let's have a look at this. One of them is extra special. I know you're waiting to see it. We'll get there in just a moment, but we'll start with this. It's an original Japanese Mega Drive from 1988, the first one to come out. The colour scheme is different to the one I'm familiar with. I mean, I really do like the red accents. I like the larger gold 16-bit symbol that I had on the front there. And I even like the buzzwords, intelligent terminal and high-grade multi-purpose use. Uh, how many uses does a Mega Drive have? Not as many as a Laser Active, I can tell you. Looking above the Mega Drive now, I've got the Sega SC3000 home computer from 1983. Now this is fascinating because it was released on the same day as their SG-1000 console. It's the same thing, but it's got a keyboard and expansion capabilities added to turn it into a fully fledged micro. And yes, that included a basic cartridge for programming. And they would release a later model with a mechanical keyboard as opposed to the dead flesh keyboard with multifunction keys akin to the ZX Spectrum but it's really the console version of the two systems that grew legs. The SG-1000 is what would evolve to become the Sega Mark III, which would be released internationally as the Sega Master System. There would be other computers with a Sega badge on them though. And that takes us to our final system, the Sega Terra Drive. To bring the Terra Drive to this display, I needed to go and collect it from our old friend Gary, who, shock horror, has sold off his retro collection. So I took a trip down to Somerset to meet up with Gary and to meet up with his lovely dogs who I wasn't allowed to take away with me, which was a shame. And uh, Gary helped me load up the Sega Terra Drive carefully into the car and I very slowly drove back to the cave. The Terra Drive, I'm sorry to say, is not working at the moment. It's not working yet, <laughs> which means we will make a full episode or a series on fixing it very, very soon. I'm determined to get this going and um, it definitely won't be the last that you see of it. Released in 1991, it was made by IBM. Of course it is, with a keyboard like this. Mmm, clicky. And a tiny, tiny spacebar. The system is an IBM PC with a 286 CPU and a Sega Mega Drive. Good idea? Well, a 286 was very out of date in 1991. The 486 had arrived and 386s were commonplace. So the PC was underpowered, but the hope was that the Mega Drive would take the strain for gaming and that 286, well, it wouldn't matter too much. It would be fine for PC productivity. That message didn't really cut through with the public. It was seen as an underpowered PC or a very expensive Mega Drive, both of which I think were correct conclusions. If it feels familiar, it's because we have seen a similar British system before. That was the Amstrad Mega PC, which came a couple of years later with the same idea, and it suffered exactly the same fate. But there's a really important difference between the two machines. While the Amstrad can be a PC or a Mega Drive, the IBM can actually communicate with the Mega Drive when it's in PC mode. This means it can be used as a development kit to create games and run them on the Mega Drive, or games can utilize both sides. For example, Puzzle Construction, which was bundled with it, allows you to create levels on the PC, but then play them on the Mega Drive. And it's that platform sharing capability which I think makes the Terra Drive a much more interesting system for me than the Amstrad. It came with IBM PC-DOS 4, and while there are some familiar words in the manuals and commands that I can pick out, 
I can't find a single trace of karaoke in there. Even better. You can expect a full teardown of this soon and we can see how those two systems are laid out inside, how they communicate with one another, if any upgrades are possible to make it a more capable PC, and of course if we can bring it to life. I really hope so. And so with that we round off a look at our little exhibition of what I hope people will find to be an interesting, intriguing and engaging selection of systems and oddities of Japanese origins. So there we have it, that's our pop-up Japanese exhibition. I hope you enjoyed looking around it today. Perhaps you learned something new, I certainly hope so. Um, it's great to be able to show you around on video and show you what I'm getting up to here um, in terms of the museum side of things. And uh, it's even better when people can come here in person and have a look around. So if, if you happen to be fortunate enough to be in the area, check retrocollective.co.uk. That's when we show when we're open up to the public and you can grab a ticket and come and visit here. Um, and also the Arcade Archive Museum downstairs. It always astounds me when I look around this place every single day how far we've come in the last few years from sitting in my back bedroom making little videos to opening up a fully fledged computer and arcade museum. And it only happens because of your support. And I should probably say this a little bit more often uh, than I do, because I never mention it on the videos. So I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, now. First of all, thank you to everyone who supports what we do here. And if you want to become a part of that and um, also gain access to our monthly patron days where we uh, have a full day in both museums. We have guest speakers. We're having a barbecue at the next one and we just all hang out and have a great time. Um, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro. This is the place where it happens. It's this support that makes it possible. Um, it, really, we wouldn't be able to survive through any other platform. This is where it happens. So if you want to uh, make a pledge, no matter how small, to help us keep doing what we're doing here, then please do head over to that site. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Is there something that you think should be here? Of course, we don't have everything. There's a huge amount more we would display if we had it. So what do we need to look out for? What would make for a more complete Japanese pop-up expo? Let me know. Thank you for watching and take care, everyone. Bye-bye.